Dear Heavenly Father, as we pause at this point in our service, we continue to give thanks to you. And Lord, as we do so, we're going to return a portion of what you've blessed us with through our tithes, our offerings, our gifts. We pray, Lord, simply that you put them to work for you and for your glory. You multiply them, bless them, and make them effective for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are feeling lost, you're in the right place. We're where we need to be, and the Lord promises, promises to meet us when we are hungry and thirsty and feeling lost. He wants to meet us in a special way here this morning. We have a number of visitors. Now, I am guessing, Scott, that you're sitting in a row of uh, Happy Tea staff, or I'm sorry, White Mountain staff? This is actually the Bible Conference staff. Bible Conference staff, okay. Hey, stand up, would you? We'd like to see who you are working at the Bible Conference. <clears throat> While you're standing... Let's pray for the Bible Conference. Would you join me in praying for the Bible Conference? Father in heaven, we thank you for the Rumney Bible Conference, the New England Fellowship, the ministry it's had through the years. We want to pray for Scott and these young people as uh, they'll be working at the Bible Conference. Scott will be directing the the, uh, White Mountain Ranch up on the mountain. Oh God, we pray that you would touch many lives by the power of your Holy Spirit as Jesus Christ is lifted up. We commit this summer of ministry to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Oh, would you stand up? No, I'm just teasing. They're well trained. You know, stand up, sit down. Uh, Today is Beulah Lyons' 89th birthday. And you don't have to stand up. You can stay seated. Well, we have many more visitors here. We have a, this is a special day, a special service. If you haven't guessed by now, we're having a baptismal service. And uh, we were commenting about how hot and humid it is up here. And that's because the, the, the tank is full of water. And this time around, the water heater has worked. <laughs> really worked. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be like being baptized in the Jordan River, I think, this morning. Um, You know, today is a special Sunday around the world. Christians around the world are are celebrating a high and holy day in the uh, history of the church. Does anyone know what special day this is? Pentecost. Today is Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we remember Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples of Jesus Christ in power. And they were changed, and ultimately our world was changed because of this, the coming of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of questions about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we want to focus in on on that very subject this morning. We've been, during this month, we've been focusing in on the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? And the, the whole point of it is that you and I might be filled with the Spirit. But what does that mean? And what difference does it make? <clears throat> this morning, um, when we came in, um, the lights 
in the kitchen and the classroom here, one, where the children's church is meeting, the lights wouldn't come on. Now, this happened last week, too. And uh, <clears throat> now, the power should have been there. I mean, we have high voltage coming into this building, and it's channeled to all, all the building, but the lights wouldn't go on. Um, now, we know what caused it. It's an overloaded circuit, so the circuit breaker went. We flipped it on, and suddenly the lights come on. What a difference it makes to be connected to the source of power, doesn't it? And the Holy Spirit living within us is the source of divine power, spiritual power. And all too many of us feel powerless at times because we're not connected. <clears throat> There's something blocking the transmission of God's power to us. And we want to understand what that is. So, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. And in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a blue pew Bible. It looks like this. And uh, would you uh, pull one up and turn to page 800 in the blue pew Bible? <clears throat> While you're finding that, um, how many other folks, you're not on the staff of the Bible conference, but you are at the Bible conference this week, or maybe for the summer. Just raise your hand. How many folks from the Bible conference? That's great. <clears throat> Glad to have you folks here. Hope you have a great week, a great summer here at the Bible conference. <clears throat> Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Everyone by being born into this world is under a law whether we know it or not. A law the law of sin and death. The, the law is very, of sin and death is very simple. The soul that sins will die. That truth is echoed throughout the Old and the New Testaments. Sin has consequences. And sin is basically an attitude of rebellion against God. It, it's saying to God, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do what I want. It's a, it's a instead of a, a God centered life, it's a self-centered life, a self-focused life. I do what pleases me instead of what pleases God, and the Bible calls that attitude sin. And every, everything that we think about sin flows from that, that heart attitude. And the soul that sins will die. But here's the, here's the great news. Everyone who has trusted Christ, repented of their, of their sin, and trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, has been born again, they've got a new life, and they've been born of the Spirit, as we've said before. There is a new law at work in us. It's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit living within has given us a new life so that we can please God. We don't have to sin. We're not in bondage to sin. Later on, Paul says that re the reality is that human beings, apart from Christ, are actually the slaves of sin, in bondage to sin. Now, I know if I came to you, or if you talked to someone at work or at school or a neighbor and you said, uh, hey, uh, how's your slavery going today? Uh, are you feel feeling bound up today? They'd probably say, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm free. I mean, this is a democracy. I, you know, there's no slavery here. Well, the reality is, spiritually, the human race is enslaved to sin. But by faith, repentance, and faith in Christ, we have been set free from bondage to follow Jesus Christ. We have been set free from the bondage of sin. Now, 
Does that mean that Christians are sinless? No, but it does mean we will sin less. But we're not sinless, okay? But there's a new law at work in our lives, the law of the Spirit, and by God's grace, the Spirit of God helps us to please God and sin less. And so, you know, the Bible uses this slavery image. And when someone is a slave, they are bound to the master. They've got to do what the master says. And, but we have a new master in Christ. And that's our Lord, Jesus. And his spirit dwelling in us shows us and empowers us to obey our new master, our Lord and master, Jesus Christ. And, and so Paul says in verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's, you see, we have certain desires in our human nature, and basically they're, they're self-focused. I want what I want when I want it, and I want it now. And, uh, I, I, you know, our... Our objective is to please ourselves. And, and so that's what drives us in life. And, but now in Christ, we've got something else driving us. It's the Spirit of God. We live to please Christ. In verse 8, Paul says, Those who are controlled by the, the sinful nature cannot please God. If you're controlled by your 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 flesh is the, the Greek word there is, uh, refers to the, the flesh, the inner self, the, the, the self-focus, the stri- you know, wanting our own, uh, our own way all the time. That's the flesh. Contrary to God, the soul that is under the control of the sinful nature cannot please God, and, and that's why the wages of sin is death. But then, but there's a new law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. And Paul says in verse 9, you, however, he's talking to believers. He says, you, however, are not controlled by the flesh or the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives within you. Can you be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit living within? Absolutely not. Paul goes on to say, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And so you may, you may think you're a Christian, but if the Spirit of God is not dwelling within you, you're not a Christian. Even though you may go to church and may be a member and you may have been baptized, you may, you may give, you may do this, that, that, and that, but if the Spirit of God does not dwell in you, you are not Christ's. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, we we shared this before a couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit is within us is God's seal of ownership. And so when you belong to Christ, God puts a seal of ownership on you, the Holy Spirit. And so the essence of, of being filled with the Spirit is to live under the Spirit's control. Or I could put it another way, we'll come back to this a little later on, it's to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. All of us are controlled by something. All of us live under the influence of someone or something. And you may say, oh, no, no one controls me. Well, um, you know, we live in an environment culture that wants to squeeze us into its mold, and it does. The media, uh, you know, politics, education, everything in our culture, in our society is designed to, to mold us into a certain image. And it's not a, it's not a God-honoring image. It's not it's not after Christ, the image of Christ in us. 
And so, who is it that controls us? And the filling of the Spirit, when we're filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has control of our lives. Now, the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, as I mentioned, means that that, um, we are God's. We belong to him. The Holy Spirit is God's seal of approval on us. But the fact is that you and I know it. We know it. I've had Christians say, well, I don't know if the Holy Spirit's there. Or I don't know if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, you'll know it. Now, how can I say that? Drop down to verse 16. Or, oh, 15. Um, 14. I can't make up my mind here. It's, it's so good. Verse 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God, we're breaking into a sentence, and so those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in the sufferings, his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The spirit within us is the spirit of sonship. If you love God, if you are seeking God and his will, If you have a desire, I want to be like Jesus. I want to know God. I want to be like Jesus. I want to do what Jesus would do. When you have that inner sense and compulsion, the Holy Holy Spirit is the one who put that there. And, you know, what is our attitude toward God? In our culture, it's sort of a take-it-or-leave-it attitude. What is, your, what is our attitude toward God? And the Spirit of God within us compels us to approach God, to know God as Father. And it's not just, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's not just a, a ritual. It's not just a rote. No, it's to know God. The word, the, the, the word, Abba is Aramaic. It means dear father, beloved father. And to know God as your beloved father. To know that he is with you, he loves you, and you love him. And he is keeping you and walking with you every day of your life, every moment of the day, throughout all your life. Abba, father. There are times when, when I get down on my knees and I, and I approach God and I say, Oh, Father, my heart is just so touched, so moved, it's almost overwhelming to think that the God who created everything and rules over all the earth raises up kings and kingdoms and takes them down to think that he knows me and loves me. He's my Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit gives us that sense. It's like a a paternity test to know who is our Father. Do you have the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, if if the Holy Spirit dwells within, then God. It's the evidence that God is your Father. And this sense of sonship is the new normal. It's it's what the Christian life is meant to be. The Spirit of God dwelling within, producing that sense that we are God's sons and daughters. Divine ownership. 
divine sonship, a, a, a love relationship with God. Do you have that sense in your heart that God is your beloved Father? This is the norm. This, is, this isn't just for preachers or missionaries or elders or Sunday school teachers. This is for everyone who names the name of Christ like we sang, it's the air I breathe. It's the air we breathe, the Holy Spirit. It's a new environment for us. Life in the Spirit rather than life in the flesh and focused on the physical and natural. Instead, it's a life in the Spirit, the spiritual realm, aware of the Spirit. Now, there is a problem. I said that Christians are not sinless, but they sin less. And that's the idea here. There, there is a problem. If the Holy Spirit lives within us, we've been born again, the Spirit of God is in there, then why, why do we, why are we, why do we sometimes fail, fall? Um, and, and I have to admit to you, I, I, fail probably every day in some way. Fail to be the husband I ought to be. Fail to be the friend I ought to be. Fail to be the pastor I ought to be. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of my shortcomings. You don't have to tell me. I know them, uh, okay? And uh, I have some close, dearly loved folks that will apprise me of that too. But I, you know, I'm fairly aware. And, uh, and so I don't always live out the spirit-filled life. Why? Why does that happen? Uh, will you turn to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in Ephesians for a while here. Ephesians chapter 4, 30. And Paul uses two words to explain the problem. And he's talking to Christians. He's talking about people who are born-again Christians. The Spirit of God lives within them, but there is a problem. Ephesians 4, 30 says this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It is possible for Christians to grieve the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, the context indicates how we do that. And, and the point is, don't do this. <laughs> but this is how we grieve the Holy Spirit. And we're so prone to do I'm so prone to do this. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness. Rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of those things. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. What happens is we're going along, everything's fine, and then somebody does something or says some, something I don't like. And I'm ripped. I'm angry. But I can cover it. And I, you know, I, maybe I'm thinking, I'll get them. <laughs> They'll get theirs, you know. And bitterness, bitterness grows. We get a bitter spirit toward this person or maybe some set of circumstances, you know, whatever it is. And then at some time, something else happens that sets us off. And we say some of the most bitter wrathful, hateful, hurtful things you'd ever, we, you'd ever imagine. Sometimes to the people that are closest to us, we turn on them. We strike them like, like a snake bite. And they're hurting. We grieve the Holy Spirit. 
We're no longer under the Spirit's influence and control. We're back under the flesh. And so, we need to get rid of those things. The Lord wants to work on those things in us, and He does it through His Holy Spirit, through His Word, as we pay attention to the Spirit. And then there's another word that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 19, 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Paul says, the, uh, the old, older translations say, do not quench the Spirit, or quench not the Spirit. And, and that's another picture. The Holy Spirit within us is like like a fire that produces energy and power and all that we need to be all that God wants us to be and do all that God wants us to do. But we quench the Holy Spirit when we say, "Uh uh-uh, no, I'm doing it my way. No, I'm going this way. I'm going to do this. I want my way and I want it now. And we, we quench the Holy Spirit. It's like you've heard about throw, being a wet blanket. It's, being, it's throwing a wet blanket on a fire. It may not put it out, but it's going to smolder and smoke. And it's not going to be effective. And we do that with the Holy Spirit when we resist Him. When we, we say and do things contrary to God's will for us. That's the problem. But there is a solution. What do we do when we've grieved the Holy Spirit? And and I've met Christians who who have been feeling powerless and directionless in their spiritual life for years. And I suspect they've grieved the Holy Spirit or quenched the Spirit years ago and have that's become their new normal. What do we do? How do we get out of that rut? Back in Ephesians 5.18, Paul says this, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You know, some people think, oh, it, that must mean that uh, you get drunk on the Spirit. You, you act out and say things you'd never do normally. It's like being under the influence of alcohol. Well, that's not at all what it means. Absolutely, the, if the Spirit-filled person is never under the influence of alcohol, under the control of anyone or anything else except the Spirit of God. What it means is that we live under the Spirit's influence, the Spirit's control. And that is not an option. You can't say, ah, you know, I I don't feel filled with the Spirit today, so I'm just going to go and let it all hang out today. I don't feel up to being Spirit-filled today. No, this is a command in the imperative be filled with the Spirit. And it's not only it's not only a command, but it's in the, in the Greek, in the present tense you Greek scholars, present tense means continuous action. And so it's accurate to translate this, go on being filled. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time event. It is an ongoing experience with God that is the norm for the Christian life. Christians who are not filled, Christians who have grieved the Spirit, who have quenched the Spirit, that's not the norm. To be filled with the Spirit is the norm. David when he had sinned one time, cried out in Psalm 51, 
Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. David had grieved the Spirit of God, quenched the Spirit in his life, and he knew it. And he went to God in repentance and faith that he might be filled again with the Spirit of God. And so do we. We go on being filled. <clears throat> Some people want to know, well, wait a minute, you know, there's the baptism of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. What's, what's the difference? And there is a difference. The baptism of the Spirit is the initial infilling. When the, the, the first time that the Holy Spirit fills us, there is an awareness. There, there is a moving of God in our hearts, in our lives. He touches us to the core of our being. But, you know, life, life happens. And we're, you know, we're, none of us are sinless. None of us are perfect. We live in a fallen world. There's a spiritual conflict going on. We grieve the Holy Spirit, you know, or we just grow cold in spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. How are we filled with the Spirit? In John 7, Jesus gave a wonderful invitation to the people of God and it, and it tells us how to be filled with the Spirit of God. In John 7, 37, Jesus said this, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Spirit has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And then John adds this note. By this he meant the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Here's the picture. I'm feeling a little dry up here. Um, but I've got, a I've got a cup of water down there. So, um, But, you know, have you ever been thirsty? I mean really thirsty. Your throat is dry. Oh, no, no, no. It's okay, John. It's okay. I know we have so many caring and helpful people, but um, once I'm done, I'll get it and be filled. <laughs> Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, really dry. In a desert, dry climate. Or, you know... Whatever it is that taxes you, you're, you, but you are so thirsty. And you think, ah, I, you know, I'm not going to make it without water. And then someone brings you a cup of cold, clear water. And you drink. Maybe I should be drinking that thing, but anyway. That's the picture. Of you and I, we, we get dry spiritually. We get thirsty spiritually. But that thirst is good if it takes us to Christ. Jesus says, come to me. And so we go to Jesus, the source of living water that wells up to eternal life. We go to Jesus. And we drink until we're full and satisfied in spirit. And go on and the spirit of God, the spirit's presence is manifested in our life. We're going to talk about what that looks like in a moment. But go to Jesus when you're feeling dry, spiritually, thirsty, hungry. Go to Jesus. Now what does it mean to go to Jesus and drink? What I do is I go to Jesus on my knees. Posture is not all that important, but for me, it helps somebody get on my knees. 
I go to Jesus, I have my Bible here, and I have my hands folded here. And I go to Jesus. And I'm with Him. He speaks to me through His Word. It's amazing. When you go to Jesus like that, how the Word of God comes alive. And it's the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit wrote the Word of God through holy men of God. And He's the one that enables us to understand the Word of God. And so, He speaks to me. And I speak to Him in prayer. And there's this dialogue going on. And I come away refreshed in spirit. Filled in spirit. Ready to do spiritual battle another day. Ready to face the challenges of Monday morning or whatever it is that we face. Filled with the Spirit. Now how do we know that we're filled with the Spirit? You will know internally but there are some things that God has given us that help us know that we're, we're filled. We can tell and others can tell when we're filled with the Spirit. It's like gas in the gas tank. Aren't you thankful that they put that little gas gauge on your dashboard? That you don't have to go and take off the cap and look down and shine a flashlight. Do I, uh, do I have gas in there? No. We, there is a gauge. And God has given us a gauge. And there are two things I just want to refer to. There's a lot of things we could say about this. But I think the most obvious is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit... And, and Paul gives nine characteristics of the Spirit-filled person. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And, my friends, it's a package deal. You, can, you may say, oh, I'm not, I haven't been very faithful, but I've been kind. Um, I'm pretty joyful, but I'm not, I haven't been gentle lately. I've been kind of rough and mean, actually, but I'm joyful about it. It's a package deal. They all flow from love. If you really love God and love others, everything flows from that. And we often think of this in terms of individual and personal experience. I'm filled with the Spirit, and so I, I'm loving. But it, has, it impacts others. And this is what Paul talks about. If you go back to Ephesians chapter, chapter 5, where Paul said, commanded Christians to go on, keep on being filled with the Spirit, it manifests itself, itself in the context of the body of Christ, in, within the congregation. He says, be filled with the Spirit and speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we know when we're, we're filled with the Spirit as a body, we know when God is at work and breathing and energizing us as a church, when we see this kind of thing, we're, we're together, we're, we're, you know, we get below the superficial. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great, you know. How's the weather? Oh, it's fantastic. Ah, it's lousy, you know. We, we get below that. We speak to one another on a spiritual level. How are you, how you really doing? How's your spirit? What, what challenges are spiritual challenges are you facing? I mean, we get below the surface when, when we're together. And the Bible has a word for that. It's the word fellowship. Fellowship. Building relationships that are beyond superficial relationships. Getting into one another's lives to support and encourage one another. Speak to one another. And then fellowship is also indicated in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know what that means? 
treat others, all others, as if they were better than self. Put, put others ahead of myself. Isn't that simple? It's just so easy. Treat others as better than myself. No, it's simple, but it's not easy. But this is real fellowship. That kind of relationship with fellow believers, it's a manifestation of the fullness of the Spirit in a congregation. And then the other is, the other word, fellowship, is worship. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. You know, it's not enough to sit there or just, just to stand there and never, you know, I, there was, I once read an article, it was called Songless Saints, which is an oxymoron. When you're filled with the Spirit, you don't hang on, or, mm, I'm, I'm, never, I'm not going to sing. Make a joyful noise, forget it, you know. No, when you're filled with the Spirit, you, it just wells up within you, whether you can sing or not. You know, make a joyful, you know, it's joyful noise to the Lord, but it's, it's a, literally a, a joyful sound. You know, it may not be in tune, but it ought to be joyful. The Spirit of God does that. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. And uh, always giving thanks in the name, to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks in everything. That's simple, isn't it? Thank you, Lord, the car broke down yesterday. Thank you, Lord, it was in, it was in the shop three days. And we, we had to scramble all week. Um, I mean, but a thankful spirit is an evidence of the Holy Spirit's full, fullness in our lives, in our congregation. As a congregation, we're facing challenges. You know, the power would, have not, would not have gone out if we weren't all crammed in here together, every, all our, our ministry. I think it's great. I think it's great to be so close and, and uh, to be so, you know, all together. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the power went out and uh, the phone isn't working. And, you know, there are, there, there are challenges uh, we've got we've to walk. If you're parked over there, you've got to walk all the way around. You know, and it, you won't believe this, but sometimes it rains in New Hampshire. And so, <laughs> you know, you may experience a, a, a good New Hampshire storm some Sunday morning, but I don't know what, cha- you know, there are going to be challenges. But a thankful spirit, give thanks in all things, is an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Are you thirsty this morning? I am. I'm thirsty to know God, to know His power and His presence. I, I want to be filled with the Spirit of God every day. Do you? Then go to Him. Go to Jesus every day. Even if you're not feeling particularly dry. I'm not a morning person, so I'm, you know, I'm emotionally kind of dry in the mornings as a rule. And, uh, but go to the Lord every day, every morning. And Ask. You know, it's as simple as that. Jesus said, pray, seek, knock, and it will be open to you. And then he said, if you know how to give gifts, how much more will the, your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, God wants to fill us with our spirit more than we want to be filled. If only we would go to Jesus and pray and ask, and seek, and drink, he will fill us. 
Do you want it? Let's ask. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Right now in silent prayer, quiet prayer, go to the Lord Jesus. You know whether you're dry, spiritually dry, or feeling distant from the Lord. You know if, whether or not you've grieved the Holy Spirit by things you've said or done. You know what's going on in your heart. You know if you're filled. You know if the Holy Spirit is there. If the Spirit's not there, then you need to repent and trust Christ. Be born again, born of the Spirit, so He dwells within. If you, if you, you know you're a child of God, but there's that distance. There's that dryness. You need to be filled. Go to the Lord right now. Ask him to fill you with his spirit. To satisfy your thirst and the hunger of your soul. Oh Lord Jesus, we come to you. Oh, we're so thankful that you give us your spirit without measure. You want to fill us full that, that the rivers of water would flow from us to touch others in our church and touch others in our community, to touch the world through us. Oh, God, we come to you and ask you to fill us and thank you that you will fill us with your precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.